Welcome back ladies and gents, Professor G here. What I want to do today is I want to give you some general historical context in order for us to begin our discussion about Islam. And to give you some general historical context, I'm going to begin a little bit with uh, what we consider to be uh, Western history proper, uh, that is with Greece and Rome, and then get briefly get into the history of Christianity uh, and to set up and to transition to talking about uh, Islam as a whole. So we have here the, the when, I, when, I, when I talk about Western history, uh, I'm really talking about and what typically comes to people's minds uh, is the history of, of Europe, maybe Eurasia, modern day Turkey, Palestine, uh, perhaps Northern Africa. And the reason why people generally think of that geographical area surrounding the Mediterranean as the West is because of Rome, is because of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire uh, and the unification of that geographical area under Roman rule. So let's talk briefly about the history of Rome. Um, Rome really begins uh, as a republic, uh, as, as it's a small, Rome begins as a small city-state uh, slowly it expands throughout the entire uh, entire Italian peninsula, uh, but Rome begins as a republic in 509 BC, um, and this will mark, we'll say, Roman Republic. Now, typically, when people think of Rome, they think of the Roman Empire. They think of the Caesars. Uh, they think of uh, gladiatorial games and pomp and spoil. And what they're really thinking of there is the, the Roman Empire, not necessarily the Roman Republic. When we talk about the Roman Republic, uh, we're talking about Rome's general rise to power beginning um, in Italy. Uh, from there, they spread to uh, what was then called Gaul, modern day France. Uh, eventually, what happens is that Rome accommodate, uh, uh, absorbs uh, Greece. And what's interesting about Rome and Greece is that really Rome borrows very heavily from Greek culture. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the Greek myths, uh, Zeus, Athena, Apollo, uh, Dionysus, all these good guys, they're, they're, they're taken in by the Romans, given new names, but the, the simple structure of the, myth, of, of the myths are generally kept the same. Um, so to talk briefly about Greece, Greece has two, gives, gives uh, Roman history two major contributions. Uh, the first is taken from Greek's political system. Greece is known in ancient Athens for having the world's first democracy. And of course, uh, democracy is a method of government in which the governmental decisions are made uh, by the vote of the people. And when we talk about uh, democracy in ancient Athens, what we're really getting at uh, is free males voting for political decisions for that city. And the Romans adopt um, a slight variation of democracy uh, in its structure of its republic. The republic is run by a senate. Uh, typically consisting of the wealthier members of Roman society um, who were elected or generally agreed upon by the people. And this Senate um, would make decisions on behalf of the rest of the empire, typically speaking, for the good of Rome. Uh, much in the same way today. The United States today um, is not technically a democracy. Uh, rather, it's a representative republic. Right? We vote on uh, senators or speakers of the house, uh, mayors, sheriffs, all, the, all these uh, government officials. We vote on them based on how well we think they will represent us. And this is, this is what we mean when we talk about the Roman Republic. Another thing though, I've, I've mentioned this briefly before, the Romans also borrow heavily from Greek culture in terms of the arts, the, both the, the physical arts, in their style of painting, in their style of poetry, of writing, of plays. Uh, but also by the arts we mean um, philosophy, literature, 
And of course the miss that we mentioned as well. And so the Romans absorb all of this into their culture and the Roman Republic lasts for about 500 years, give or take, and the Roman Republic comes to an end about 44 BC uh, when Caesar Augustus, who was a commander of Roman legions in Gaul, again, Gaul, modern day France, Caesar Augustus leads his legions into Italy across the Rubicon and marches his legions through the streets of Rome, thereby bringing an end to the Roman Republic because he militarily takes over the city of Rome and establishes himself as emperor. Now, while his reign doesn't last very long, his reign does mark a shift in Roman history. Yet, Roman civilization as a whole continues on. So we hit year zero here. We'll come back to year zero, but uh, on the Western calendar, of course, year zero, we celebrate it every year come December. Year zero, uh, traditionally speaking, marks the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. Of course, probably wasn't born exactly on year zero as we conceive of it, but uh, nevertheless, this is what tradition holds. So the Roman, once we... Once Caesar Augustus takes power, sorry, once Julius Caesar takes power, um, we start the beginning of what's referred to as the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, which saw a swell in Roman territory and Roman power, and also marks the beginning of the Roman emperors. People like Julius Caesar, who held absolute power. Now the Senate's still there, but they're primarily there just um, just to make the people feel better, to make people feel like they still have some sort of say-so in government policy. But the Senate uh, really during this time lost most, if not all, of its power. So we have the beginning of the Roman Empire, which also lasts for about 500 years, coming to an end in 476 AD when the German tribal leader, Osiander, sacks the city of Rome. Traditionally speaking, this is held to be the end of the Roman Empire as we know it. Uh, but of course, Rome doesn't really fall. It's, it's still there. And really, this marks the end of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, the Roman Emperor Constantine will move the capital of Rome from the city of Rome, uh, to the city that he founds, which he names Constantinople, also known as Istanbul. Uh, so the Eastern Roman Empire continues to survive, although the Western Roman Empire uh, becomes, becomes saturated uh, with these Germanic tribes who moved down in from Germany. Uh, so 476, traditionally speaking, marks the end of the Roman Empire. Okay, but the end of the Roman Empire, but Rome as a legacy, as a civilization, continues on for about another 1,400 years. If you've ever heard of the Holy Roman Empire, for example, uh, during the Middle Ages, it takes on, it is power is no longer seated in Italy, but is rather seated in modern day Greece and Turkey. Okay. Also during this time of the Roman Empire, you have some very important uh, cultural and religious developments that are going to sort of set the stage for Islam, perhaps the most important of which is the rise of Christianity, getting back to year zero here. So, Christianity, of course, is founded uh, and centered around the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. But as with the Buddha, Jesus wasn't out to create a new religion. Jesus didn't say to his disciples, you know, we were once Jewish. Uh, we don't really care for that anymore, so we're going to start a new religion. That's not quite what happened. Instead, Jesus uh, set out to reform Judaism. He set out 
to correct the mistakes that the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the time, what the mistakes that he perceived, what was wrong with Judaism in the first century. Uh, and he had some input and had some corrections to say about those things. And it's because of this and it's out of this uh, that we get Christianity. So we're going to start a little graph over here. Christianity, of course, is derived from Judaism. Judaism is the mother religion, so to speak. But it's going to take on a very different tone and tender of the Jewish tradition. So from about 0 to 100 AD is where you have the sort of founding documents that are written um, by the early Christians. By this, of course, I'm referring to the writing of the Gospels, but also the writing of the letters to the churches by Paul of Tarsus and by Peter, um, which by 100 AD, basically we have the writings of the modern day New Testament are circulating amongst the early church. But the problem that the early church faces, and of course, if you read, for example, the book of Acts in the New Testament, it's really a history of the early church. And the central problem that Christianity faces within its first hundred years is what exactly are we to make uh, of Christianity's relationship to Judaism? That is, all of the early Christians were once Jews. But now they're seeing a fundamental conflict between the teachings of Jesus and what was traditionally their Jewish faith. So much so that they decide to split away from traditional Judaism. And you see this at play in the books of Acts regarding some fundamental questions about whether or not Christians have to abide by the teaching of the Jewish law. So in the first hundred years, the battle is really between Judaism versus Christianity. Are we still a part of the Jewish uh, people, of the Jewish faith? And Judaism as a religion is really a religion centered on and around the Torah. And the central focus of the Torah is, of course, the law. So we have read some selections from the book of Exodus. If you remember, the Torah is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. And the primary focus of the Torah is to tell in Genesis the origins of the Jewish people. In Exodus, it is culminating, it is building up to the meeting of Yahweh with the Jewish people on Mount Sinai. And what happens at that meeting? Yahweh gives the Jewish people the law. And the law tells the Jewish people, the law tells them how to eat, how to dress, uh, how to treat each other, how to uh, make economic transactions, how to operate and behave within a societal context. And the law is given in order to set the Jewish people apart. The law is what makes the Jewish people stand out as God's chosen people, and they recognized it as such. And you have 300 plus laws within the Torah, and these laws deal with a variety of different things, and these laws are still held by Jewish people today. So you can probably think of various uh, dietary laws concerning Judaism. Jews, for example, don't eat pork. Uh, they have to have uh, uh, meat that is prepared in a special way, a particular way. Uh, the meat has to be blessed by a rabbi. The animal has to be killed in a particular way in order for it to be kosher. Okay, So Judaism is a religion of the law, centered on and around the law that is founded in the Torah. Now, intentionally or not, Jesus undoes this. And this is why we have the split. Jesus says that he didn't come to do away with the law, but he came to fulfill the law, if you remember from the New Testament. However, his teachings undermine that law. So 
the law according to Judaism is what's supposed to set us apart. It's what's supposed to make us special as Jewish people. It's what it's how the world recognizes that we are Jewish. We are God's chosen people. And so the early conflict that the early church faced is, uh, well, we're getting a lot of new converts who aren't Jews, who don't follow the law. Uh, do we make them follow the law? Do they have to follow all of the laws? What exactly is the deal here? And so there's a big debate within the New Testament. You can see this throughout Acts and throughout uh, Paul's letters to the churches over do Christians have to abide by the law? And the answer that the early church comes to is no, not really. So one of the big problems they had is that Christianity spreads very quickly amongst the Gentiles, amongst non-Jewish people, the Greek and the Romans, for example. Well, one of the major tenets of Judaism concerning our outward manifestation that we are God's chosen people is the practice of circumcision. Okay, so you're getting a lot of adult converts. So not to give you a, a strange picture in your head, but you're getting a lot of adult male converts and they're like, hey, uh, that whole circumcision thing, is that really necessary? Um, and the ultimate answer, sorry, I dropped my marker. The ultimate answer that the founders of the early church give is that uh, the law isn't necessary. Is it necessary for what? The law isn't necessary for salvation. Because as a Christian in Christianity, what are the conditions that have to be met in order for a person to be saved? Well, the Christian answers, those conditions have already been met. So within the Jewish tradition, you have this idea that people, of course, make mistakes. People break the law. People break their covenant relationship with God. And in a lot of instances, they have to atone for their mistakes. They have to atone for their sins. So in the Old Testament, this was done by transferring your sins to an animal, which you would then sacrifice to Yahweh to show him your dedication. Well, in the New, the New Testament claims that Jesus is that sacrifice for Christians, that no other price has to be paid. So our salvation is no longer dependent upon the law and is no longer predicated on the law why? Because Jesus' sacrificial act on the cross has already atoned for our sins, so we, have, we can already achieve salvation. Salvation is there. We don't have to do anything. In fact, we can't do anything because Jesus has already paid that price. And so the law essentially becomes obsolete. No longer needed. So these new Christians that are coming into the church, the early church fathers said, well, um, you know, it's not really necessary. You don't have to do this to be a Christian because Jesus has already done it for you. See how that works? So Judaism is a religion of the law. Christianity really does away with that tradition. Christianity is more... Uh, and it leads to a, uh, as a result, um, Christianity, due to some other factors that we'll talk about here, Christianity becomes very speculative as far as religions are concerned. And it's speculative because in order to reach the Greek people, Christianity bumps up against Greek and Roman thought, specifically Greek and Roman philosophy. And you, again, you see an example of this in the book of Acts. Paul goes to the church. He goes to Athens, and he's ministering to the Greek people. So he goes to the Acropolis, and he's preaching. Who is he preaching to? He's preaching to Stoics and Epicureans, practitioners of Greek philosophy. In order to reach these people, what does Paul do? Paul speaks their language. He talks about Christianity within the context of Greek philosophy. In order to reach the Gentiles, the uh, Christian church beginning around 100 AD starts to speak the language of the Gentiles, tries to make Christianity socially and intellectually uh, acceptable for uh, intelligent Greeks and Romans. And in order to do this, it starts to incorporate 
Greek philosophy. And Christianity, this is the beginning then of Christian theology. So the debate that surrounds the, uh, from about 200 to 325 is the early church is seeking to answer the question, who are we? So if we're not Jewish, then what exactly are we? What exactly do we believe? How should I think about Jesus? How should I think about the Gospels? How should I think about the church? These are some very fundamental questions that the early church had to answer. And in order to answer these questions, oftentimes they appeal to philosophical reasoning. So the question over the nature of Jesus, just who exactly was Jesus? An area of study referred to as Christology. Was Jesus fully human? Was he just like a rabbi? Uh, was he fully God? Was he like some sort of lesser God? Was he like a spirit that was just kind of like floating around? Who was Jesus? And so these are the questions that the early church was presented with. And these are quite really fundamental questions of identity. What are we going to believe about Jesus? What as we as a community, uh, what are we going to decide to believe? And this culminates in 325 AD with the Council of Nicaea, when the Emperor Constantine calls a meeting of Christian bishops, and as a result, we have the formulation of the Nicene Creed, a statement of faith. If you are Christian, you believe this. Okay, so what does any of this have to do with Islam? Well, Islam uh, develops out of this context. Muhammad was born into a tribe of merchants and traders known as the Kadesh in modern day Saudi Arabia. He was born into this tribe of merchants and traders. And as a result, he traveled throughout uh, the Middle East and he came into contact with both Judaism and Christianity and also with paganism. Make some room here. With paganism. Paganism being distinct from Judaism and Christianity, insofar as Judaism and Christianity purport to be monotheistic religions, paganism is polytheistic, and the town in which Muhammad was born, the city of Mecca, was sort of the hub of pagan thought. There was a, a stone there that was believed to have come down from heaven, known as the Kaaba, which was a, a very holy site for the pagan tribes. So Muhammad is confronted with all of these different uh, thoughts and beliefs and religions, uh, all claiming to know something about God, and he sort of goes through this spiritual crisis. Okay, what, do, what exactly do I believe? So he's, he's got the option, he, meet, he meets some Jewish people, he meets some Christians, he meets a lot of pagans who all believe in all these different sorts of God. So he's faced with this question, well, which is the true God? Which God am I supposed to believe in? I have all these different options. How do I know which one's better than the other? What am I supposed to believe? How am I supposed to, uh, what sort of criteria do I use to decide between these? So Muhammad, being a very pious man, goes on a regular basis uh, in nightly prayer, seeking answers, praying to God for answers. Uh, and eventually, Muhammad receives an answer. Muhammad receives an answer from the angel Gabriel, who recites to him the Quran, the saying of God. Now, if Gabriel sounds familiar, that's because Gabriel comes out of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Remember, it is Gabriel who visits Mary to tell her that she's going to give birth to the Messiah. So, Islam views itself as the continuation of of the Judeo-Christian tradition. It is the next step, the final step, the final revelation. It draws upon stories taken from the Hebrew Bible. Adam is believed to be the first Muslim. He is the first monotheist in history, as well as Abraham, as well as Moses, uh, and as far as Christianity, as well as Jesus. Jesus plays a prominent role within Islam. 
So Muhammad takes the Judeo-Christian tradition and just as Christianity comes from Judaism, so Islam comes from Judaism and Christianity. It is a continuation. Okay? It views itself as deeply connected to both Judaism and Christianity. So we'll end this lecture here, and I'll begin the next lecture telling you about the life of Muhammad and telling you about the sort of beginnings of Islam. All right, guys, if you've got any questions, be sure to email me. See you guys next time.